With Super Tuesday coming up on March 3rd, there are a number of fighters for working people on the ballot, and one of them joins me now. He's the founder of the Young Turks, the founder of Wolfpack, the co-founder of Justice Democrats, and running as a congressional candidate in California's 25th District. Cenk Uger, welcome back to the show. Thanks, David. Uh, it's great to be back. Um, uh, I, I love progressive media. Uh, because <laughs> even you just reading one line of, about my resume is already better press coverage than anything in the national media. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, the, the way that the, the media frames uh, issues generally, I mean, I was watching some MSNBC this morning, and uh, it is crazy. They had James Carville on, and he's talking about how, you know, you can't run Bernie Sanders, he's going to ruin the country. And, like, they keep wheeling out these people from the 90s on television. I mean, what is your... Uh, before we even get to your race or any other issues, what is your take on the media right now and basically the meltdown that's happening? Okay, so first of all, disaster, obviously. Uh, second of all, let's talk about Carvel for a second. He, he said, I don't want to be part of a cult referring to Bernie Sanders and the supporters. Okay, sorry, James, too late. You already are part of a cult. You're part of an establishment cult that thinks that uh, running a moderate candidate like Hillary Clinton is uh, the way to be electable. You know what cults do? They brainwash you until you believe things that are demonstrably false and can't possibly be true. James, she lost to Donald Trump. Picking someone like her would be the worst idea, not the best idea. Get your par parents to get you out of that cult and deter <laughs> You, Hey, James, you thought Joe Biden was the most electable. He came in fourth in Iowa, and he's going to get humiliated again tomorrow in New Hampshire. Get someone to deprogram you. And the way that they do program you and brainwash you is through the mainstream media and, and cable news in particular. And of all of those, the worst of the worst is MSNBC. Yep. So no channel hates Bernie Sanders and us progressives more than MSNBC does. They are the heart of the establishment. Uh, CNN is at least open to us. Fox News finds us interesting. They might call us socialists, but they actually from time to time go, well, you know, they make an interesting point about not going to war or standing up for the average guy. MSNBC is like, no, corporate overlords should rule you. By the way, you're in a cult. <laughs> so do you see this ever changing? I mean, this is, let's just, like, I don't want to get too, too ahead of myself here, but let's say a progressive becomes president and there actually is a shift in how people view politics and realize that, hey, you can actually get something done when you have a president on your side in the White House. Is cable news going to then all of a sudden have, you know, Nina Turner as a host on MSNBC? Or are they just going to crash and burn with the establishment? What's actually going to, you know, how do you see that all playing out? So that's a great, great question. First of all, my wife makes a great point about when I get frustrated with the press. She's like, look, you guys are leading a rebellion against the establishment. What did you want them to do? Send you a thank you card? <laughs> right? So of course they're going to be against you. And is cable news part of the establishment? They're all part of multi-billion dollar corporations that are doing great in the status quo. Why on God's green earth would they support people like us trying to do a rebellion? Of course they're not going to support that. What do you think? Out of the goodness of their heart, they're going to like, you know what? Forget profits. Let's just help the average guy. <laughs> it's never going to happen. Now, so, but then on the other hand, to your po uh, point and your question, David, is, well, they love power and they love sucking up to power. So what happens in a situation where progressives have power? Uh, my guess is uh, malfunction, malfunction, computer meltdown, 404 <laughs> error. <laughs> okay. So they'll try to probably kiss up the progressives. They'll hire a bunch of couple of progressives for a while, right? MSNBC will be first, and then CNN will hire a couple of progressives too. They're like, okay, no, we're, hey, power, we're, we're, we're catering to you, don't worry, right? Uh, as is their nature. Mm -hmm. But then the body will reject the virus because mm -hmm. they, multi-billion dollar corporations that make hundreds of millions of dollars from drug companies are not gonna have you speaking out against drug companies. The people who make literally billions of dollars from money in politics, because it goes into TV ads, are not going to be against money in politics. So they'll turn on Bernie the first chance they get, and the honeymoon will be very brief, and uh, and then they'll go full boat trying to paint him as Trump. And, and you'll see, mm -hmm. I mean, look, you're going to see that right now, right? Yeah. And you're seeing it right now. But even after he wins, that'll definitely happen. 
and, and then we'll have to fight the system and we'll have to win and we'll have to beat them. And maybe one day, you know, we're the new cable news, we're the new media, and they just go fall by the wayside. And by the way, that's capitalism, baby. Uh, if you're, you know, serving the powerful and the elite, there's like 17 of them. And if we're serving the people, eventually we're going to kick your ass. Yeah. So you've had, um, uh, you're running in this race in California's 25th district. You clearly have talked to a lot of voters in that district. What are your view on, or what are you getting from people that you talk to? Are they, do they have very clear political leanings? Are they, you know, definitely progressive, definitely a conservative or are people kind of in the middle and, you know, judging these candidates based on what they're talking about, judging you based on what you're talking about, how, how do voters actually feel about um, this primary and about uh, your race? All right, first of all, can I just say how psyched I am that I finally got my merchant? Okay, so I've got my Jenk <laughs> shirt. Nice. Hey, these are collector's items, so check it out, jenk2020.com. Uh, <laughs> okay, no, seriously, um, uh, that's such a great question, David, because uh, number one, uh, the mythology of the independent voter. So the mythology that you hear on cable news as part of their cult is – Independents love both parties. <laughs> <laughs> they like both parties so much, they just can't make up their mind. Whoa, I love Republicans, but I love Democrats. Which one do I love more? Okay, uh, I've now talked to thousands of voters. And I can tell you, both in the polling and anecdotally, and without a shadow of a doubt, they actively dislike both parties. They mm -hmm. don't like either party. In fact, they can't stand them. When I tell them I'm the leading Democrat in the race, but Democratic leadership hates me, they're like, where do I sign? <laughs> where do I sign? I said, look, I'm going to be, uh, I got to be honest with you. Um, Mitch McConnell doesn't like me at all, and Nancy Pelosi likes me less. They're like, where do I sign? Okay. <laughs> because they're so tired of the Democrats kissing up to the Democrats, the Republicans kissing up to the Republicans, being these uh, political robots. Uh, they, they, distrust both parties, they're uh, disenfranchised, disenchanted. And so when an independent uh, comes in who is a progressive, a populist, and says, I I'm going to try to end the corruption and I can't stand the leadership of either party, it we win them in overwhelming numbers. So the only question left in my race is whether I could reach those people, whether I have enough money, whether I have enough volunteers, jank2020.com for both of those to be able to reach those voters. If we reach Democrats with our message, our message plays way better than the corporate Democratic message within Democrats. I can talk more about that later. And with independents, we won over 100% of them. So same thing with Bernie Sanders. Every poll shows you he does better with independents. And then idiot Democrats go on TV and go, you know, you shouldn't vote for Bernie Sanders because he's an independent. Wait, wait, you can't say he's unelectable and say it's bad that he's an independent at the same time. That makes no sense. Independents are more electable, not less electable. Believe in core democratic ideas, but don't suck up to democratic politicians and you'll landslide people. Yeah, and going off that point, I mean, you look at any poll, you look at, at recent Gallup polls, the majority of people identify, self-identify as independents, and it's been that way for years now. Like, people are definitely rejecting both parties, and that's exactly, as you're saying, that's exactly what Bernie Sanders speaks to, because he fights the establishment in, in both parties. Now, kind of going off uh, what you were talking about here, I've seen two appearances from you on uh, the talk with Santa Clarita, the radio show, uh, with host uh, Stephen Daniels. Now, the first interview, I noticed, was a little bit um, heated at, at points. The second one... I can already see him. This is just my perspective. I already see him opening up to what you're saying and, and to kind of and, and being open to these ideas. What is your approach when trying to educate people? Because clearly to have somebody who is more of a, I guess, centrist or moderate, he may consider himself to be um, now being pulled over to, to your worldview in only two appearances. How do you approach a conversation like that with someone who um, just doesn't agree with you at the start of the conversation? Yeah. So first of all, I'm, I'm winning over core Christie supporters. That's my main Democratic opponent. Uh, not only am I winning over all, all everybody else, but I'm going into her core supporters and winning them over. So how? How in the world do you do that? They know her. They've known her for a long time. Uh, and, and a lot of them are actually what they perceive as and what they label as moderate, right? So um, the way you do that is have conversations that explain your theory of change. 
Now, I know it sounds like, hey, that sounds a little ethereal and, and it, you know, is that a little too much intellectualizing a political race? No, it's really important because the cult of the establishment media has brainwashed people into thinking progressives are wild-eyed dreamers and radicals that don't know how to get anything done. In reality, we're the pragmatists. Why? Because our theory of change is true. What is it? It's to create public pressure until you move legislators in the right direction. So I give example after example. The Civil Rights Movement, everybody knows, any historian, anyone who's ever studied it, knows that Lyndon Johnson would not have done the Civil Rights Act or the Voting Rights Act without enormous pressure from Martin Luther King and the Civil Rights Movement. What moved him was not any legislator, was not beseeching him, was not being nice to him, but was creating tremendous public pressure. The suffragette movement, they had no chance in the world. How could women get the right to vote when they don't already have the right to vote? And they need an amendment. And three quarters of the states to ratify, totally and utterly impossible, right? Mm -hmm. They created tremendous public pressure. It isn't to feel good, it isn't to vent, it is to be practical about how you get to change and how you pass bills. As, and the other side's point of view is, well, if I beseech Nancy Pelosi and Mitch McConnell long enough, maybe they'll be nice and give me something. Well, when you paint it like that, it's obvious who's right and who's wrong. And, and, and they, they, they have the wrong theory of change. And the people who are honest and smart look at that and go, well, that's true. It's mm -hmm. obviously true. Yep. So um, Christy Smith, you, you, you brought her up here. She's your main main opponent in, in this race. Is she willing to debate you yet? I know she's been dodging debates. Is this going to happen or <laughs> you're not going to end up debating her? So you know, here's the situation. So uh, we were supposed to do a debate. She ran. Uh, she got uh, a college that she's gotten funding for uh, to cancel one of the debates. It's so sad. Uh, she's run from every single forum. Hasn't come. To, she didn't even come to League of Women Voters for her. Then finally, on 21st and 22nd, we have a forum on the 21st and a debate on the 22nd. And then all of a sudden, the debate on the 22nd is canceled. Oh, my God. And now we're working on the forum. It should happen. And a lot of people reserve their seats. It should be interesting. It'll be the only time that Chrissy and I are in a room together where we can, you know, discuss the issues. Okay? Mm -hmm. But – I don't now they're saying like, well, maybe we'll split up the candidates. No, 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 no. Enough hiding, enough running. OK, it's not about facing me. It's about facing the voters. Mm -hmm. And look, she she runs for the media. She runs from debates. She runs from me. Why? Because she has no issues. It's total emptiness. That's why uh, for moderates, uh, uh, roll call called her a dream candidate because <laughs> Being full of fluff and air. You know, she sent out two mailers. These are the big ads that you do that you get in the mail uh, for the candidates. One of them is, uh, I am pro-veterans. Who's anti-veterans? <laughs> and the second one was, I am pro-community. Who in their right mind is anti-community? What kind of a monster would be anti-community? Yeah. They make so, it just vague enough so that, you know, people can kind of uh, apply their own thoughts to that candidate without actually them having to say anything. Like, it's... It's incredible. Like, how do you, how are you able to really make your case to people um, that may be on the fence here if you can't directly, you know, have a debate with somebody who is supposed to be, you know, the, I guess the, the democratic choice from the establishment in this race? Like, how do you, how do you make that case to people when you can't even speak to her uh, directly and really, and really compare the, those two, uh, your records and your policy platforms? So a couple of different elements here, and this is really interesting stuff about running a race, and no matter what happens, I'm super glad that I know all of the nitty gritty details now that I've lived it, and I can share it with you all. So number one, of course you're gonna do ads, so you know she's gonna do ads for puppies, I'm gonna do ads for Medicare for all, and getting higher paying jobs and ending corruption, and we'll see what resonates more. Number two is uh, volunteers and organizing, getting out there. Uh, not only do I have thousands of volunteers, we've now done over 210,000 calls into the district. I mean, nobody's ever seen anything like this, okay? Wow. So we have an army of people who want this victory so bad because it's important to the movement. It isn't about me, it's about all of us, mm -hmm. okay? So meanwhile, she brings in, she buses in people from outside the district from her Democratic establishment politician friends. They have this little circuit that they do. They bust them in and they're like, okay, I guess vote for who is it? Is it Christine? <laughs> Smith? 
I mean, mercenaries, warriors beat mercenaries. So that's yeah. point two. I'm, you know what I'm doing? I'm out in the malls. Okay. You go to the AV mall, you go to the Valencia mall, you'll see me. Okay. I'm talking to people. I'm knocking on doors. Uh, I'm making phone calls. So we're going to outwork them and we're going to reach uh, people that way. Uh, now, the third thing is uh, debates, et cetera, that where you would go face to face. But she's not the only one running, by the way, David. There's 13 of us in the race. And there's four major candidates, me, Christy, and on the Republican side, Steve Knight and Mike Garcia. They're also running for me. Like, Mike Garcia is crazy to run for me because he need Steve Knight's a former incumbent. My, Mike Garcia needs name recognition. Man, you'd get a lot of name recognition if you debated me. Everybody would cover that, right? Yeah. But he won't do it because they're all afraid because they got nothing. They got nothing. So that 21st, if they're actually in the room with me, is going to be amazing. But that we don't have a lot of. Last thing is the is the media. And so the local media, I'm winning them over because I keep talking to them and they keep going, well, that's a good point. That's a fair point. Wait a minute. This guy might actually be right. <laughs> so... But in terms of the national media and the other groups, they are the worst. And so, look, I'll give you an example that's really, in a sense, dispiriting. Um, to your point about how do you know who to vote for if you don't talk to them, right? Um, well, I, every Democratic politician and their mother has endorsed Christie, uh, even though she has an F rating from Courage, California. That's 100 Democratic groups combined. She endorsed a Republican for her own seat. Uh, she's voted with Republicans dozens of times. I mean, she's just one of the most conservative Democrats in California. Okay, I'm not surprised that all the corporate Democrats love that. They're like, oh, and a Republican in Democratic clothing. We love it. We love it. Okay, let's sneak her in. Oh, she'll help our corporate friends, and then we'll say something we can do. That I'm not surprised by. Indivisible endorsed her. Mm. Now, Indivisible uh, is part of the 100 groups that Courage California – uh, talks to in rating the assembly members. So Indivisible gave her an F rating and then endorsed her. Wow. Now, now that's insane to begin with. But on top of that, I know those guys. I've had them on the Young Turks numerous times. I've helped raise money for them. Mm -hmm. I've helped get volunteers for them. I've helped promote their events. And I've talked to them personally. No call, not one question. They just bowed their heads and said, yes, establishment, absolutely establishment. We'll, we'll screw over a fellow progressive. Well, I guess they're not progressives. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you are someone who has an F rating from your group uh, and you won't even talk to the progressive in the race, I guess Indi Indivisible's new name is indefensible. Yeah, that's what these these uh, these races are really showing now. It's it's essentially mask off for a lot of these groups who pretend to be progressive, but when, that, when it actually comes down to it, you see who they support and who they don't support, and it becomes clear who's actually calling the shots. And in many cases, like you just described, it's not really the the progressive uh, people or, or the 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 movement of people that are calling the shots here. It's the leadership. Um, let's go to the Iowa caucus now, because this is. Uh, I'm sad we have to keep talking about the Iowa caucuses <laughs> like a week later, but Pete Buttigieg. So before the Iowa caucus, Pete Buttigieg stopped an Iowa poll because there may have been one mistake that they heard from one guy. And now you have the actual results littered with errors, but the Iowa Democratic Party has now given the delegates out and uh, Pete Buttigieg has two more than Bernie Sanders, even though Bernie has more votes and there are all these errors in the Iowa caucus results. What do you take from this? I mean, has this shaken your your confidence in the democracy if you can't even count the votes properly? Like, how are people supposed to really take the information from the Iowa caucus results and think that they live in, uh, you know, a democracy? Yeah. So, believe it or not, I, I, I'm, I'm okay. Uh, so, he, here's uh, my sense of it. Look, uh, I always knew progressives had to overcome way more hurdles than any normal candidate. They got to overcome the brainwashing that the entire corporate media does, and even things that we've been told are liberal our whole lives, like NPR and New York Times. Again, some of the worst in media in despising progressives. Uh, I mean, that, that editorial that they had uh, for their endorsement, the New York Times, was comical. They just kept calling Bernie Sanders radical. <laughs> oh, God, he doesn't even want to represent the powerful. What kind of a monster is this? He wants to represent average people. Mm -hmm. Radical, right? 
So you got to overcome that. Jesus, that is a giant hurdle. It is the loudest megaphone in the world. All of the American media blasting out propaganda against all of us. That is an unreal hurdle to overcome. Okay, then on top of that, of course, the Democratic establishment is against you. And they're going to do everything they can uh, uh, to, to try to stop you with all these little tricks, etc. The third problem is we have a broken system. So the Electoral College is broken. So as much as um, I ridicule them for thinking that the Hillary Clinton uh, is more electable when she didn't win the election, she did get three million more votes. Why is she not president? Mm -hmm. Al Gore got more votes than George Bush. Why isn't he president? It's insane, this system. And here we are now within the Democratic Party. Bernie gets, look, 6,000 more votes on the first vote, but put that aside because you, there is a second vote in Iowa. Okay, that's fair. And on the second vote, he has 2,500 or 2,600 more votes than Buttigieg. And they look at that and go, obviously, Buttigieg should get two more delegates than Bernie. Oh, for God's sake, right? And so, but at the end of the day, David, they're not going to be able to stop it. So everybody knows Bernie won Iowa. So all the idiots on TV can go, well, I mean, Bernie got more votes, but we're giving it to Buttigieg. And mm -hmm. you know what that does? People go, screw you. Then I can't wait to vote for Bernie just to show you guys. Yeah. He's got a lead in New Hampshire. Tomorrow's New Hampshire. Oh, it's gigantic. It's gigantic. He's got to win there. If he wins and he wins big, oh, my God. Okay. Now, Biden's had a 20-point lead in Texas for a year. Last poll, Bernie closed it to two points. Last poll in California, Bernie's got a 14-point lead. Mm. Now, that's Look, it's got to be an outlier. I'm keeping it real. Guys, you got to keep it real. It's got to be an outlier. But in like three out of the last fours, Bernie's had a sizable lead of at least five points in California. If Bernie was California and Texas in 23 days, no, now 22 days. Na, 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 it's <laughs> over. It's over. And then seeing them cry on cable, it's just so going to be delicious. It's going to be like the greatest thing you've ever seen. <laughs> First of all, if you're watching live, including tomorrow, now this is not about the campaign. Go watch the Young Turks because we don't cry. We love it when progressives win. All right, UIT.com, and we cover all those live. But I mean, peek in to see if Chris Matthews is being carried out on a stretcher. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you see them already talking up Bloomberg now. I mean, they're they're already getting ready for you know uh, the. The backup, essentially, like, you know, Biden dropped, uh, as you just as you described, Buttigieg has no real path past the early states. So it's already looking like they're going to all be hyping up Bloomberg. Do you think Bloomberg can make a real dent just through television ads? Because right now that's what it is. And now the DNC changed the rules so he can he can he can be on the debate stage. But I'm not sure if that's going to work out for him if you have Bernie Sanders, you know, smashing him on stage. So, like, how do you see the whole Bloomberg thing uh, working out here? Yeah. So. How do we get this lucky? <laughs> so if I drew up a scenario for the progressive to be able to overcome all those built-in hurdles and win, it'd be this one. So I would have a front-runner moderate who actually is a terrible politician and has no chance of winning, sucking up all the energy and time and attention for a whole year, Joe Biden, then coming in fourth in Iowa and New Hampshire, mm -hmm. okay, and collapsing. And then I'd have the only other moderate choice be a 12-year-old uh, <laughs> that uh, runs this campaign from a wine cave underneath the New York Stock Exchange. <laughs> and I'd say, I mean, that's just like no experience, totally unlikable, a robot, talking point machine that only people on cable news can like. That's how I would draw it up. And then he takes away mo votes from the, the leading moderate Biden, right? And then they've split up the vote so many different ways between themselves. The other progressive gives a lot of energy to the progressive movement, Warren, and then fades just as the election is coming. I mean, you can't. And then they have a false hope. Don't worry that Biden and Buttigieg, et cetera, aren't going to win because their false hope is, what, months later? This thing's mm -hmm. over in weeks. Months later, Bloomberg's going to come to the right to the rescue off of his white knight from Wall Street. That is a terrible plan for them. And Bloomberg, are you kidding me? How the hell is he going to get Democratic votes? Yes, he's doing literally hundreds of millions of dollars in ads. He might hit a billion dollars. Yes, they are affecting people. That's the cancer of money in politics. But they haven't heard the other side yet. So when you go to those uh, 
different states, Texas, California, et cetera, and Bernie makes his case, and people say, hey, you know what? Bloomberg did stop and frisk. It was deeply, deeply racist. And Bloomberg defends Wall Street and says that bankers are awesome and they're your friend and they should run the economy. Na, 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 na. They have a deeply flawed strategy. And I got to be honest, in a sense, we got really lucky here. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Jenk Uger, thanks for joining me. Uh, give your last pitch to the voters here for uh, your race in, in the 25th. So uh, Jenk2020.com. Guys, number one, we're people powered. If I win this, the people see so make you can make phone calls from anywhere in the country, okay? You can text from anywhere in the country. And it's driving them crazy that we have a lot of progressives throughout the country. They're like, that's not fair. You have too many supporters. Hey, well, how about you bust your ass for the last 20 years fighting for progressives so maybe they'll fight for you? So, that's, so you want to serve the corporations? Then go to your corporate friends. I'm going to you guys because you're my friends. You're our family, okay? So jank2020.com slash team to volunteer. And everyone who made one – sent one text, made one call, gave it one dollar, it's your victory if you win. Jank2020.com slash go for money. But I will leave you on this, guys. If I win and Bernie wins, I no holds barred. I'm not mincing my words. If you know me, you know <laughs> that's not what I'd die. I never mince words. But I'm running as a congressional candidate here who has an excellent chance of winning. And I'm telling you that I am going to be the enforcer. So whether Bernie wants it or not, I don't even care, right? I, I'm going to make a list. If you vote against Medicare for all, we now know how to win elections. I, this is a purple district I'm in. If one of the most progressive guys in the country wins in a purple district, they're like, look, I hope you got a 20-point lead because I'm going to make a list. Anybody who votes against Medicare for all, anyone who votes against getting money out of politics, anyone who votes against Green New Deal, we put your name on a list. We get a great primary opponent, a progressive. We know how to win these elections now. We bring in volunteers. We bring in money. And we take you out. It's the last vote you'll ever have. That's how you do politics. That's practical. That's real. And if they don't like it, they can go cry. But we're going to get the voters universal health care. And we're going to get the goddamn money out of politics. Jank, thanks again for joining me. And to all my supporters out there, support Jank, donate, get involved, do whatever you can to help him win, in addition to helping Bernie Sanders win, because it will completely transform American politics if both of them get in. So, Jank, thanks again. All right. Thank you, David. Really appreciate it.